Okay, give me a cue. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Clevey, and I'm uh, with the Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association on the Board of Directors and also your host for the Renewable Energy Seminar this evening. Our seminar is part of a solar series that uh, John Sarver and I do, and uh, with a couple other people as well, um, highlighting uh, interesting solar projects for Michigan. Um, the Renewable Energy Seminar, which I do, uh, looks at uh, policy-related issues and, and those kinds of things that impact the industry as, as a whole. Um, our sp sponsors for the Renewable Energy Seminar are the Michigan Department of uh, Energy and um, Environmental uh, Sub DLAG, um, and uh, not McKay, and uh, I hope I'm not missing someone else, John. Um, I'm, I'm having a computer problem. I'm out in the Cape Cod, and we've had a weather uh, blip, and my computer has gone down, so I'm I can't see anything on my uh, screen, but I can talk on my phone. So I have a couple things I can't see, and that's one of them. Um, Tonight we're going to have a presentation, I think a very timely um, uh, presentation by um, Chuck Hookham, um, who is the CEO and president of Arbor Technologies. Uh, um, and uh, Chuck is uh, well known in the renewable energy industry. He's done more solar than just about anybody that I know. Um, also, uh, he works uh, closely with a large scale projects, both utilities great and, and sort of the standalone industrial uh, projects as well as small projects as well. Um, I worked with Chuck on the uh, Ann Arbor Energy Commission. He's deeply involved in a program that's going on that we'll be talking about next uh, month, the sustainable energy utility that's happening in Ann Arbor. Um, and recently Chuck and I uh, have been talking about his work in energy storage. Um, and tonight we're going to have a presentation on, on energy storage and with a particular focus on, on community energy storage. Um, energy storage is, is necessary to, to modulate the grid, to get rid of congestion, to do, uh, deal with issues of intermittency, um, but it also uh, is an interesting opportunity from an economic development point of view. Um, I was reading today in the New York Times how it's uh, out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, um, investors are showing up now um, because of the tax credits and uh, tax benefits that are coming out of the Biden White House, but more importantly because energy storage is a very interesting uh, play for renewable energy. Um, essentially with, with energy storage, you buy low and sell high, and if you're a wealthy investor, you're quite used to those kinds of, uh, kinds of plays. Um, so there's money being put into building large-scale um, energy storage, um, and literally, it is uh, storage is there to uh, to sell power and store power, um, and uh, it can go in places like warehouses. It can go in all contaminated sites. It can go in the middle of people's houses. There's lots of ways that the storage play can can play out. And the person who probably is ground zero for what the opportunities are and how it works is Chuck Hookham. So we've asked Chuck to come tonight to talk about. What's happening? Those of you who are interested in community energy, um, community solar, should be particularly interested in in what Chuck is talking about now, um, and the role that uh, communities can play in uh, this really interesting twist that's happening with renewable energy. So, with that, Chuck, I will turn it over to you. John Sarver is going to monitor the chat, and um, at the end of the presentation, John will uh, uh, ask. Uh, that the people in the audience just go down and raise their hand. We'll call on you uh, for your question. And uh, John will kind of field those questions so we don't get all congested up. With that, Chuck, you're on. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks, John, for having me tonight. Uh, the GLREA attendees appreciate your time and on a busy time and busy window. We're all looking forward to trick-or-treating and I'll try to not put you to sleep early tonight. Um, I could probably talk about energy storage for oh a few days. Um, I've been involved for quite a while. Um, my uh, main mission in life at one point was working on a project called Ludington, and many of you have heard about it. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight too. That was really the first big tranche of energy storage in Michigan. Um, a lot of great thought went into that, and it's been a really super project since we've since it was installed. Um, so I'm going to talk probably for, I guess, 10 or 12 slides. I'll try to move through them reasonably quickly. 
it's really a primer on energy storage and then moved more toward where are we headed here as a community based community facing distributed energy kind of mindset is we start to move away from central generation central storage more toward the grid edge out to the distribution side what is it going to look like what what opportunities are out there those of you that have solar at your house maybe an opportunity to leverage extending it into battery um, maybe um, looking at aggregating yourself and so i'm going to talk a little bit about those topics tonight i tend to be long-winded and get on a mission and keep talking so if you need to interject um i guess john please watch the, the chat and put up a, a timeout symbol symbol on your uh, hands there if you could and i'll try to slow down but i'll try to march through it like i said it's a ton of information um, I'm very active in this business of storage and how do we take advantage of technologies that are rolling out quickly, um, both at the EV level, so at the, at the charging of uh, and motive part of transportation, as well as what are we doing at buildings, because we, we recognize that both transportation power supply buildings are what are producing the most amount of carbon. And if we're worried about the anthropogenic carbon that we're emitting, we need to stop and, and pause and figure out how to get around that. What, how do we stop what we're doing and make stepwise changes into something that makes a lot more sense without breaking the proverbial bank? So it's really a, an interesting time to be in this space. Technologies, like I said, are rolling out very quickly. We're very mindful of being commercially viable. We don't want to step into some technology that like Selectria um, or excuse me, Selectria is a good one. Cylindra is not so good. Um, they're very closely named, um, but Cylindra was not a good experience for a lot of people. And we want to avoid those kinds of uh, morasses that can slow us all down. So I'm gonna move quickly. Um, uh, so the purpose is to introduce everyone to storage, particularly as we move toward a little bit larger storage than perhaps a smaller battery in your house. Um, the outcomes are just to move the needle for you all in terms of where we're going with storage and to talk a little bit about storage at different scales. One of the things you'll probably hear me talk a lot about is storage at your house is great for you. It doesn't really help anyone else other than maybe a neighbor who runs their extension cord over and borrows some energy once in a while from you um, because the grid doesn't benefit from it so much the grid has you know there's some some smaller scale benefits to the grid but it's really not a, a super uh, benefit until we start aggregating so the first definition i wanted to bring forward is aggregation and that's where we start to integrate different scales of buildings or homes or community solar together to form a larger aggregate component that now all of a sudden makes a difference because at the grid level, <clears throat> we can take advantage of some of the battery or other storage mechanisms attributes like frequency regulation and maintaining the grid stability at a bigger scale. And now all the utilities of the world are very interested in talking to you because now you're adding stability to something that's hard to maintain. Um, you'll hear me talk a lot about ahead of meter. So we have storage at the head of the meter like a Ludington. We also have a lot of storage behind the meter. Um, community solar will tend to ride um, in that space um, ahead of or behind the meter depending on scale. It's probably always going to hook together at the distribution level. So think of DTE level rather than the transmission level, which is the ITC level, um, simply because of cost efficiency and Again, taking advantage of being at the grid edge and not necessarily someplace centralized. I mentioned DERs, those are energy storage renewables more at the distribution level. One of those technologies is a microgrid. I'm gonna talk a lot about that. We have really good experience in microgridding, which is again, moving generation away from a central plant and more toward where we use the energy local to our businesses and homes. Um, there's a major difference between power and energy. Power is in megawatts, energy is in megawatt hours. We generate at a certain amount of power that we can produce by one single unit, but we can produce it for a certain amount of time. And that's that generation of power over time is what we get out of energy. So you'll hear me talk a lot about that. There's the third component of that called ancillary service, which I'll talk a lot about because the grid is, is somewhat unstable and to maintain it instability 
takes a lot of effort and all the things we're putting in the grid can cause disruption if we're not careful and, and I spend a lot of time in the disruption space. Resiliency is a really key component of energy storage because it provides the ability to withstand or overcome a loss of conventional power through use of storage that may be existing on site. So we're building a lot of resiliency hubs. These are typically like community centers and places where we can ensure that people of all economic profiles and communities, um, residences that may be next to one another can centralize some of the resource and go to it in case of a power outage that might be long. Think about August of, of 2003 and those windows when we lose days of our life because all of a sudden the grid's not available and what do we do? The resiliency hubs give us a way to go and move forward. Um, another technology I'm really involved in is V2G, which is basically electric vehicles and being able to push energy that we stored in the vehicle back to the grid when we need it. It's a bi-directional activity. I'm not going to talk much about virtual power plant or virtual power purchase agreements. They're complicated, but just think when I say virtual that it's integrating a lot of different technologies together without having to have them all wire connected to produce the same end value. So it's kind of a paperwork exercise, but there's always capacity and energy products behind it. So first out of the box is community solar. So when you think of community again, it's not an individual homeowner, it's a group of people. It's a, a community might be the state of Michigan, it might be the city of Ann Arbor, it might be the local residents um, and a couple of residences that are remote. Community solar is where we aggregate some of this. And some of these people may not be able to put solar on their rooftop or put batteries in their home, but collectively or through the way of getting financing, they can aggregate it and bring it together something they can share in, they can pay for, but not necessarily have on their property or in their in their backyard again. So it's a it's a bulking or aggregating process that you can go through. There's been movement in community solar. Michigan's got several. Um, some are utility owned. Some of them are um, muni owned, like the one in East Lansing. There are quite a few out there that are starting to pop up across the country because they make sense. They, they basically enable people to participate that want to participate without having some of the mechanisms that prevent them to move forward. So think about solar is probably the best way to, to grab um, electrons from a, a, an area that has good exposure and can be used then to uh, assist people that want to own solar generation. And now all I'm going to do is add a battery to the equation. So what we're doing here with this battery, and I'll show you electrically how this looks, but basically taking a battery, installing it in the same exact facility, using the solar to power it. So we're DC coupling the, the power coming out of the solar right to the battery. And then we can change the profile of how battery works with solar to dispatch. And I'm going to show you the time shifting benefits in just a minute. What it does to the community that owns that battery storage, locally it provides them a place to go to for, for resiliency, but it also provides that additional revenue stream. And there's a number of streams that are out there that are available to owners, but um, we need to we need to keep pushing the envelope because these projects with batteries only really make fiscal sense when we can layer together all the different value streams that a battery can bring. So this one, this this particular picture is kind of an interesting one. I want to spend a little bit of time at it. So if you were to grab just the picture of of this curve, this is um, megawatt. This is a larger battery. This is a 100 megawatt scale. So one of the projects I'm working on that's more of a grid connected battery, but it could be any scale. It doesn't have to be this big. This would really fit any profile. But if you look below the hash line that's going horizontal, that would be the production if you had just solar. And the way we design these systems would be normally we have some clip solar. So that little blip on the top of the screen um, would actually be slid down. And that would be generation from the solar side that would not be usable because you can't push it out to the grid because we have a limit on how much that interconnection can handle. So what we do with a battery is kind of unique. So now we're going to put a battery in with the solar. 
you see some sliding sections on the sides of this graph, which are which are calling shoulders, which are available depending on how you size the system. But effectively, what we're doing is we're using the same solar generation in windows that we cannot dispatch that solar to the grid to charge the battery, and then we're we're time shifting it to the right, and we're time shifting it. And if you look in the red red lines, I'm showing where DTE's time of use rates fit. So at about three o'clock in the afternoon till about seven o'clock at night is our peak power window. And so you, you can really see the benefit here if you are the owner of a storage system, if you were to be able to charge your battery with solar that you couldn't sell to the grid and, to, and then come along later on in life when the sun's going down and actually push that solar to the grid when peak power is needed and when the value of that power is highest to the grid, obviously that makes a lot of sense. Now, there is some mismatching obviously out there. I think um, John Richter and others have spoken on this topic at, at length, John Freeman too, about the, the inequality perhaps of the value of that solar. If I'm pushing the solar out to when it's really needed, there should be some benefits to that. Those, that's, a, that's probably a four hour discussion, maybe more than that on its own. I won't go into the weeds, but I wanted to illustrate to people the advantage of layering solar and battery together. I will also talk briefly about another project I'm involved in that we built down in Ohio that layers on wind on top of solar and the battery. So now I added another dynamic, which is being able to capture stranded wind generation and charge my battery or stranded solar generation charge my battery. And when they're not blowing, push that to the grid because a lot of times when there's no solar and no wind, now the power prices have shot up and now I can make money selling it that way. So that's that's a value proposition if you're the owner of solar that you want to grab onto. So if you're if you're going to spend money to build a battery, those are the kinds of things you look for. The same mindset in a community solar project. So I'll talk a little bit in a minute about the business side of, of, a, of a community solar project. But think about this. If you're part of a solar plus storage project and you can sell more electrons to the grid, obviously your revenue profile is going to look a lot better, particularly if you can find a way, and we have some other ways, other states where I'm working right now, where that the value of that peak power is higher. It's amazing and almost dramatic at times how much value there is. Like in Texas, the power prices there are crazy right now, and if I had a battery, at certain windows of time, I can actually use an expert system to figure out when that makes sense to dispatch. I can pay for my battery pretty quickly when I do that. So this is pretty informative as far as how does a battery work? How is it best fitted to be used for the energy capacity of it? This is just the value proposition of time shifting its capability. There are many other value streams. Hopefully I'll have time to get into those, but I need to keep, keep moving here. But a good good graphic of a daily benefit of adding storage to solar. Just a quick snapshot of the grid. Um, community solar is typically going to fit down in the in the grid connected area with local distribution. This is really, you know, today we're seeing a lot of smart homes come to play. Um, we're seeing people with a lot of generation at their, their side of the meter. So the distribution side of this, the illustration here is adding a lot of these capabilities at the distribution level you need to find a way to the transmission side because that's what moves power around the space that you're in the problem we're going to run into and i'm involved in this locally is what happens when we add a lot of generation that are local distributed energy and now we have ev chargers and now we have um loads that we hadn't planned on electrification buildings that are demanding more power all these distribution lines were sized for one capability, and now we're changing their capability a bit. So there's fear that we're gonna get into a situation where all of our distribution circuits are overloaded and we won't have the ability to take advantage of these technologies. The, the interesting thing about a community solar project is it can, it can actually solve some of those problems by smoothing out the renewable energy that people are pushing to grid and serving some other purposes, which as an example, if you if you tailored your community solar and storage with EV chargers as well, now you're finding another way to charge vehicles that don't have to rely on the distribution grid to serve the chargers. 
So we're layering all these kind of benefits together to try to come up with strategies that work within the fabric that we've got, which are the old grid that we've got. We're, to rebuild the grid is expensive. We have to try to find ways to work with what we've got. So adding technologies like this is really important uh, going forward. So really basic stuff, I'm going down to the single residence. I'm also going to show you the aggregation side again. So single residence, this is your typical hookup. Most of you, many of you probably have a, a setup like this. It's fairly simple. You've got a battery and you've got solar and inverter and a way to move that power both to your loads and out to the grid. So your loads are served first. Any excess power goes to the grid. And this is how you receive your benefit by actually building credits against what you're consuming at other times so you can only put in so large of a system from a single residence point of view down in the right hand corner is an illustration of aggregating there are communities popping up and i was at one called reynolds landing it's in alabama where basically the community itself is its own power generator it's got um batteries all over the place that can aggregate. It's got solar, it's got backup generation, and it's got a battery, and it's interfacing with the grid. And I keep raising this point that it's got scale. And by having scale, all of a sudden it's helping the utility with loads on its distribution system. Instead of being harmful and disruptive and potentially a concern of overloading the circuit, now it's balancing the circuit and everybody that's on that circuit, including people outside of Reynolds Landing, win because the grid is much more stable. So this aggregating function is really important. Um, Mark mentioned earlier about the SEU in Ann Arbor. That's kind of one of the same mindsets. One of the benefits is you can aggregate some of these loads or generators and create a less disruptive system. So that's what this is all really about. Um, again, just kind of a summary, basic stuff. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Um, historically without storage, any load, you turn on your light, you had to have a generator online someplace, a DTE plant or a consumer's energy, somebody had to be generating to meet the load. And that load is served within very tight dead bands on voltage and frequency. If they get out of whack, then we have what's called a brownout because something is not right. And now the, the loads that are being served, the equipment can't handle it. So they basically stop functioning and it gets worse. It can cascade into a blackout. There are ways that we have available to us on the on the grid level to help stabilize the grid. It's called automated generation control. So all of our big generating plants have ways that they can balance these these issues. Inertia being one, voltage, frequency. But as we move away from these larger plants with AGC on them, and we're bringing on inverter-based loads, inverter-based power, it's all of a sudden a different character. It acts differently. It doesn't respond as well, perhaps, to things that happen at the grid level that maybe these larger inertial generators have. So we have to keep in mind the grid has limits and always keep those things in mind. Um, everything is not as simple as just connecting to the grid and everything works. What's running through the wires is a very tightly controlled system. I'm going to run quickly through this is a muni in Michigan that I've done a lot of work with in my life and so I'm just showing you some snapshots I just want people to gain an appreciation for what's going on out there at the grid level. So this is a picture of a day um, wherein we're showing a couple different things um, we're showing a curve of what the load looks like on their grid during summer winter and spring so three different curves um, and across a, a typical day. And the, this this particular snapshot I wanted you to pick is December 3rd, which was from, I think, two years ago. It shows you where I'm pointing to in the winter, a peak load that was happening. And in this case, the peak load for the day was at almost 10 o'clock at night. So you've got this window of time, and it's a pretty flat curve. They have a fairly large load base. They have generators um, on, this, on the grid, and they have fairly load, high loaded industrial commercial load system. So it's got a nice profile to it. It's not like all, all residents or all major loads. It's, it's pretty balanced. So hold this thought in mind, keep this picture in mind, and I'm gonna move to the next one. So this is that same day, December 3rd, 2020 it was. And now I'm showing some new curves. I, I'll pause here and I'll try to explain everything to you. So you've got this blob in the middle 
And this blob in the middle is representative of the solar large solar system that's connected to their grid. And this is what it looks like from eight in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon. That's its generating capabilities. It's notice it's in kilowatts. The, the orange curve is we have some wind generation connected to the grid as well. And that wind curve shows what it did that same window, how it's generating pretty smooth. So it was a pretty windy day, pretty standard, pretty, pretty stable. Up above, now you're looking at some of the, the, the demands on the grid. Obviously, if your curve is above what we can generate, we can't sustain this with, with renewable generation. Also, you see in the solar curve, you can see where clouds are going by because you're seeing very large transitions of, of generation. So what that does is it disrupts the voltage patterns on the grid. So we really need technologies that can avoid the disruption. As we start pushing toward more and more solar and more and more wind, more and more renewables that are not thermal or not all the time generating. This disruption can be solved very quickly with two combinations, a, 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 tech, a um, battery based solution or a storage based solution plus electronics that can sense this happening and respond quickly because these changes happen very dynamically. So in this case, this particular community has natural gas based generation online as well that, that can handle that change with, with ease. But if they had, if that gas were taken off the system and replaced with something else, if it weren't something dispatchable like a nuclear product, if we move totally away from carbon-based fuels, we've got to fill this void up where we're going to run into trouble on days like this. And frankly, we can't afford brownouts to be happening in the middle of the day when we have all of our critical loads going on. So um, really storage is the solution for solving some of this dynamic that's happening at the grid level. So it was recognized that storage is important and credit goes out to a lot of people. They're mostly listed on the cover of this IEI report. It's the Energy Storage Roadmap for Michigan. It came out last year. Um, it's a really detailed read. I mean, it, it will take you a week or two to read it um, cover to cover. Um, they did a good job of listing things from an immediate short-term and long-term perspective, as well as who is the focus point, the target audience for making changes. and. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it. A lot of good information, like I said, really good people wrote this. But there's a there's a big problem in this. And, and the big problem is that the people that really have the responsibility to keep the lights on, the utilities and large munis and folks like that, are really driven by electric markets and MISO. So if MISO doesn't provide any benefits for you to put in energy storage, would you ever build it? It's, it's really challenging to go to the Public Service Commission and say, I want to spend money on building a big battery and having no certainty on recovering the, the cost to build it. We've really been fighting this. FERC 2222 is out there, which is a driver to, to change the MISOs of the world to value energy storage and to add markets for us to build these types of assets for. But the reality of it is, until that changes, it's really hard to, to move the needle. Um, anybody that is not a utility that cannot monetize its investment over a lot of different ratepayers even has it worse because now how do you go, go and get compensated to build that? Somebody has to sign up for the attributes from it and it's really difficult. Um, as an example, PJM, which is the, the alternate to MISO, it's on the more Eastern side of the country, came out with a, a, a fast frequency regulation market, which was purely tailored to get more batteries to plug into the grid came out and probably the first three years were very lucrative so if you got in and put a battery in that was large scale and could contribute to the response to that frequency balance problem they were having you made out like a bandit and you paid for your battery some of the batteries i put in back in those days have been moved somewhere else now they they were paid for and no longer add value the market has dropped dramatically and you could not make money building a battery in that market today. And it's one of the few markets that exist out there for purely a battery to be installed. So until these market issues get resolved, it's really hard for us to take advantage of that information and have the state's needle move in a different way. Um, a lot of movement behind that, but that's really a fundamental flaw that I want people to be aware of is until we really value these attributes, it's hard to make batteries fit. 
I'm going to shift now into the community solar side of that and more, more in the storage piece as well. There is a growing number of projects out there that are that are coupled storage and solar, like the, 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 the data I showed you earlier. The main drivers for these early bird installations are there's a problem, whether that's at the end of a end of a long circuit where they've had blackouts and there needs to be a local solution. Um, maybe there's some equity problems where the community needs to be served with something that's more resilient and they, they live in an area that's that's really frankly not a nice community to live in. Those those people are paying a lot for their energy likely and have to suffer. So there's some equity things we have to deal with here. Or there's resiliency issues. So the drivers are are communities where these issues exist or where these opportunities have been taken advantage of mostly with smaller scale projects, five megawatts and less. The problem we have is the states where these are being built have some mechanisms in place to enable investment, like California, New York, and New Jersey. Michigan doesn't really have much here. And there's been bills introduced over the last five to 10 years along these lines, but there hasn't been enough partisan pull to make them happen. There's quite a few in, in the current legislature there's some in the Senate, there's some in the House. These, if they move forward and move the needle, are the kickstart to where we can start seeing more community scale developments happen. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the nuts and bolts here next. So this is kind of how a, a business side of a community solar and storage business works. So really basic, I'm not gonna read anything here other than to say that you invest in a system, the sun shines, you generate electricity, you, you are able to create a revenue product that can be sold to a local utility, and then all the parties that are part of that, that own shares of it, whether it's done on a kilowatt level or done on a module level or however they've got it divvied up, are receiving benefits either through a credit on their bill or some monetary payment for what this community solar product did. A lot of solar gardens that are out there don't have, they, they may have storage attached, but the storage piece is a little more difficult to equitably share because the benefits that I mentioned earlier that are very limited are more difficult to, to split. So oftentimes the battery is either not included or it's included at a very coarse level. So we need to work on the regulatory side of this. We need to work on the rate side of this to find the right fit so that if you're building solar, community solar, there's an incentive to add the storage piece for all the reasons I've already shared to make it worthwhile to invest. Um, so the primary barriers to these have historically been financial payback, finding the benefit to, to finding the revenue stream that can support the investment. And then there's been a few little fires out there that I've been involved in. And, and We've gotten past a lot of that through changing of some of the battery technologies and putting in better systems, but the early days have, have faced that, and that hasn't helped in the adoption side. So now on the, on the energy side, I mentioned Ludington, um, which is utility scale, very large, over 2,000 megawatts. Then there's ahead of the meter, there's been a few built. I'll talk about one or two of those here quickly. And most have been behind the meter, smaller scale, the real benefit if it's behind a meter and smaller scale is aggregating. And so we're just in the planning stages with some communities that are starting to do this in Michigan. I could talk about that later. Maybe maybe that'll be a, a future um, discussion we'll have. Um, it was interesting that Michigan was an early adopter with Ludington, but since then, the, all these marketplace barriers and other things have um, caused harm. So that's where we're trying to take advantage of some of these opportunities to move the needle here going forward. Um, some of these value stacks that you see on the right side, this is a lot of information. So all, all I want to show you, share with you is these are all the attributes on the right side that a battery could bring to the table if it were if it were charged with renewable energy. So it can provide these attributes to the grid or to the owner. The more that you can stack, the more of these you can actually add to the equation the better off you're gonna be as far as return on investment. So if you're only adding a battery to do the arbitrage, which is basically the, the curve I showed you earlier, which is to time shift when you push the electrons to the grid, that's a very important part of a battery, but it's only a fraction. 
if you can add some of these other benefits, now you're really talking about a quicker payback. So that's all I really wanted to share here is the storage piece really has a lot of benefits to, we, can, we can offer to the grid, to the owner. They have to be tailored to, to layer together. They're called um, use cases or value streams. We really have to tailor them together to make the financial case to invest. So there's been a lot of lessons learned from these projects. Um, all of these projects add a lot of those attributes uh, on the right side. So the right side was all the attributes. A lot of these projects that I'm going to talk about now are utility funded. So they're basically projects that have been put together to try to understand how this battery system works. Um, Ludington, we learned a lot of out of the box. It's a large community storage project in effect because it's helped virtually everybody in Michigan. It's backstopped a lot of the renewables we built. Um, it's over 2,000 megawatts. At any one point in time, it's serving a it could serve a large part of the load in the state. Um, so it's a massive project that's really valued, valuable. Does it get compensated? Probably not like it should for all those benefits it adds, but it's there and it's, it's a valuable part of our diverse grid that we've got. And then all these other things that are starting to filter in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, each of these real quickly. Um, the project in Ohio is cool because it's wind battery and solar all matched together. And we can actually use intelligence to find the right time to charge the battery and dispatch it using renewables. So there's been a lot of lessons learned on how that works with the grid. Another really cool project um, is the, mac the macro grid in Kalamazoo. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and, and um, the storage project in Cadillac is another one where we've added solar and storage. It's fully subscribed now. Um, so it's had a lot of interest in, in um, moving forward, but it's really only the solar part of the project that's really been taken advantage of. It still has this battery to be used. And I'll quickly talk about some of the other battery projects we've had um, here as I pull some slides together specifically. So again, here's Lunnington. Um, I would encourage you to see the visitor center. It's really a treat to see this. Um, you can go down in the bowels of the plant and see the turbines. It's really a great tour. It's amazing to see how much power we can generate for almost no, foot, no visible footprint. But again, it can dispatch very quickly to the grid. It provides fast ramping. As soon as somebody sends a signal to be online, it can be full load, which is 2,000 megawatts in about 30 minutes. So it's really quite dramatic that way. Um, and again, it does, it offers all these benefits to the grid that most projects can't. Here's how it's dispatched. You see in the far left side, the red, that's called pumping. So we pump water from Lake Michigan up to that top of that pond in the nighttime when the power prices are cheap. That's in hours one, two, three, four. Then it sits there in the pond waiting for a call. And on this particular day, it got called on, you know, late in the day. And now it's generating and you can see how it's generating it's losing its pond it's losing its the blue curve is how much energy is stored so it dispatched a, a, for a chunk of hours but it still has 4,000 megawatt hours of capability so if we have a storm or we had something other event happen that was bad if the grid needed more power it can dispatch on the spot um, and provide that degree of flexibility across the board so that's how that project typically operates to to stabilize our grid this is the really cool one in Kalamazoo that I worked on a lot. Um, we looked at where does it, where can we learn the most out of putting a battery in our distribution side? And this one was put in at 24.9 kV on a circuit that was serving the Western Michigan campus on the west side. You can actually see the solar project if you drive up um, 131, you can see it. Um, we looped together a battery on that circuit so I can effectively support that is its own macro grid it, it basically can serve the loads it can isolate from the grid it can stay there isolated from the grid and be charged by the solar and that battery can sustain the grid and sustain the frequency local to that little space ahead of the meter so this is ahead of the meter so all the customers on that circuit win because now all of a sudden they've got resiliency built in this is all done with no carbon this is all based on solar and battery so it's really it's been a great lesson learned. Um, we've watched and, and, and um, you can see the list of all the solutions we've, we've um, been able to identify here that have really added some great value to that circuit. Obviously it's something that can be scaled. So this is, a, this is only a megawatt, 
But if we start looking at places we can tap this in, then we can start looking at more opportunities and um, move forward. Another cool project I'm um, sitting about um, three blocks from this one. This is an, this is the first microgrid that was public facing in Michigan, and it's um, in a building that's got tenants. Um, it's got a microgrid that's got solar on the rooftop. It's a commercial building. And we've learned so much from this as far as its ability to respond to grid events. We can push power out to the to the grid. We can totally island the building for a weekend um, and serve loads within the building. It, it, we're looking right now to, to see if we can expand it to serve uh, City Hall right next door. So there's been a ton of attributes that we've learned from this that have made a lot of sense to us. Um, and it's probably one of the safest battery installations around. So a lot of good work went into this and we've learned a lot and uh, probably can give some tours if somebody's interested in seeing this um, someday. This is electrically how it works. And one of the cool things here is you can see the battery and how it electrically ties into the grid. And the grid is the big box in the middle. That's the loads in the, the grid coming in to one particular place. You can see the solar on the left tying in. You can see the utility feeder coming into the box from the top is we have electric vehicle charging off of this and we can turn it on and off if we're in an island, islanding situation and we have reserve power, our tenants who are electric vehicle char can be charged off the grid. Um, and that's been a really cool thing to watch, let's stabilize that and make sure it works. So again, lessons learned that we're, we're bringing to the table, all these things start to affect how it looks when we get to a community storage level which we're gonna get into next. So a lot of information there, but uh, we'll keep moving. This is another cool project in Jackson that you can physically walk up and see. Um, it's called the 200, it's an apartment complex. This is about as close to community solar and storage as you can get. It's utility owned, no doubt, but it's it's got solar rooftop, it's got battery for charging, it's got EV chargers, it's got microgrid controls, it also has the thermostats and water heaters that are smart devices that you can demand side manage those within the overarching fabric of this building. It was commissioned in 2021. The batteries served the load pretty well. We haven't had any real big issues like a big blackout for several days. We would have trouble because this battery is simply not big enough to sustain that, but it would, it would operate for several hours without any trouble with all the loads that are, that are sought in it. And the really cool thing is that it it's really super highly energy efficient. The whole building was built that way. It was a new building. We could do a lot with the, the whole concept of energy efficiency. So this really drove the envelope as far as minimizing carbon emissions from the building and meeting all these criteria that we built into it and be sustainable and give us lessons learned on how this works. So the, the divvying up of the benefits from this happened at the apartment uh, owner level and get divvied into the individual renters. So it's really pretty cool. It's pretty close to a community solar and storage concept. And it's really the first step in where I see the future heading. So I'm gonna work through some conclusions here and we can get in some Q&A, but um, the Michigan community solar projects that are out there are pretty subscribed. East Lansing's is heavily subscribed. The consumers projects are, cons are pretty heavily constructed. Obviously people are interested in this and it makes a lot of sense, and it offers opportunities, particularly with equity. I mentioned project scale is critical. These community solar and storage projects are big enough to make a difference to the distribution grid. They add benefits to whoever owns the distribution, not just the people behind the meter. So when we start doing that, we're solving problems that are bigger than just behind the meter. And that's important to learn and, and keep in mind as we start broadening some of these, some of these possibilities. We certainly need regulatory support um, for all owners to achieve this and to add value and to, to select this as an opportunity. Um, but uh, in general, things are, are moving in the right direction. And then we have technologies like long duration energy storage, We're getting away from lithium ion and getting into other technologies like that organic um, um, flow battery that are Michigan based. It's, this is technology coming out of Michigan that are really big game changers because instead of just four hours, I can get six, seven, eight, 10, 12 hours out of them. And that really makes a difference because I don't have to recharge them and I get more use cases out of them. 
So that's it for tonight. Um, I'd like to entertain some questions. I put some thought provokers out there for those shy folks who might need an idea in mind or something to prompt them. And I will turn this over to John. Yeah, why don't you go down to the reactions button and just uh, raise your virtual hand so I can. Oh, Dave has the first question. Go ahead, Dave. Dave? Woohoo! I just wonder what your uh, experience with the, uh, for instance, DTE, uh, but consumers as well has been. Are they uh, on on board with this this line of thinking? Um, I, I would say different different thinking, different approaches. Um, as you know, Ludington is half owned or 51% consumers, 49% DTE. So DTE's got a part of that Ludington plant. They don't have any, to my knowledge, grid facing batteries yet. They've been watching and learning from others. They haven't made the investments in energy storage perhaps that, that consumers has. Um, I would say that that's not all bad. They can catch up pretty quick by learning and investing in, in building smart things. So it's really a matter of what does their what does their um, integrated resource plan tell them they need to build going forward. And I think their current the, the recently passed integration integrated resource plan has quite a bit of energy storage in their future. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Lee. Yeah, my question is for electricity. What kind of a market is there for the 15 minute window or the half hour window? And the reason I'm asking this question is I had a conversation with a Swiss company that was using cameras on solar farms, looking at the sky, uh, had very detailed wind analysis, and they were actually selling renewable power out on the grid, you know, because they could predict it very well. It's not dispatchable, but it is predictable if you gather the right data. So do we have a system in this country or could we have one that actually allows that kind of, of commodity market? I don't, I'm not aware of anything that's second by second or that, that fast. Um, so a lot of the projects I have that I built have, have quite a bit of technology in them. I mentioned the project in Ohio with wind and solar and battery. We have very detailed forecast of what those projects are going to have facing the next day as far as weather goes. So I know I know where my battery storage level is, um, and if I need to charge it, what does the profile look like? When's the best couple hours to charge the battery? And then looking after that, when's the best window to sell that power into the grid because I stored it and I have it available and I can push it to the grid? That th those algorithms are out there now. They're starting to pop up more frequently. I would say down to the second level is is unique um, because there are opportunities I've seen where the grid power prices change so frequently and so quickly you can't you can't react fast enough. But um, sometimes you can catch that that forecast where you have a sweet spot. Yeah, I was talking about uh, fifteen minutes and a half an hour, not on the second by second basis. Then I have a follow-up question about energy storage. You know, Michigan has another energy storage asset, and that is the salt caverns where they store natural gas. Yep. And if we if we make a transition to renewable natural gas, um, do you see uh, load following uh, high efficiency natural gas plants as a, as a, something that we use into the future? I do. It's a volumetric problem in my mind. You know, Michigan is the largest storage state in the country we have more underground storage than any other state in the united states so you'd think that that would be a natural fit for us to to move toward um i think there's two opportunities for the salt caverns and, and domes we have in michigan as well as the the abandoned oil and gas wells which is storing hydrogen which can be also developed and and, and um, fabricated renewably Renewable natural gas has got some volumetric problems. How do we how do we generate enough to make it viable? We really need a lot of natural gas, and I'm not sure we'll find the sources to do it, but I, I hope I'm wrong. But then on the waste product side is the CO2 piece, and so there's opportunity to store CO2 in our caverns um, as well. So, and a lot of study work behind how to do that safely. 
So I think there's marketplaces there for sure that we're going to have opportunities for going forward. I, a lot of my relatives want to move to Florida. I say, I don't have no interest in Florida. I got all the great things in Michigan, you know, looking forward. We have water, we have storage, um, look at all the attributes. So it's, it's one of those technologies that we need to use because it's, it's a different technology. It's not all one. We're not doing once we're not doing all solar. We're not doing all wind. We need diversity. And so I think there's some opportunities there for that. Thank you. I agree. Chuck, could you talk a little more about MISO? Is is MISO doing anything with respect to storage and the you know the various values that it can provide? Do you see that changing any time in the future? Yeah, they they're I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use the the word we use here because it's not such a nice word, but they they tend to be MISO tends to be the slowest moving ISO that's out there. They look and see what CASO has done out in California. They look at New England ISO. They look for leading edge indicators of what the other ISOs are going through. And they tend to work last. Now, sometimes from a technology point of view or from like introducing storage to the markets, those of us that are in the market get really frustrated because they're, they're late to the game and we end up not being able to do anything. And we're seeing all the other ISOs get the benefits from it. But then sometimes they do things smart because they watched and learned. And so in, instead of like following PJM down that frequency market I mentioned, they didn't, they never did anything like that. They don't have a fast frequency. They really didn't see the need for it or the value for it. They didn't create one, but now they're looking at FERC 222 and figuring out how to implement it. And some of those things are coming to play and they're learning from what other ISOs may have not gotten right. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I, I don't think MISO, well, I shouldn't say it. I can't, I shouldn't say it. Some of the things that I have personally on my mind, the people I work with, I don't know that they appreciate the value that it provides them. But I think as as more and more renewables come online, like my project that just came on in Arkansas come online, and they see what they, what impacts they have to the grid, they're going to want more storage and they're moving in that direction. And it sounds like you, the FERC, uh, the feds are pushing them to kind of move in that direction too, right? So they may be uh, kind of slow, but they're getting pushed, it sounds like. Yep, in a few different directions. Um, they started out at the transmission level uniquely, and so ITC was looking at battery storage, and there really wasn't a lot done because it's hard to find a fit with do, do you double conduct or something or you do put in other smart grid technologies or do you build a battery and, and inject it and i did a non-wires alternative study that showed it was cheaper for me to do more wires and more smart grid than it was to put a battery in to solve a solution such as we have a circuit that's overloaded or such as we're worried about resilience it was easier to put in something redundant and cheaper than storage but I think that's starting to change a bit, and um, I'm hoping that we'll see that more in the future. And uh, Chuck, I have the sense from uh, the way you've talked about storage that a, any size storage has a place. It just depends on what's appropriate, right? I mean, yeah, but it, you know, it could be small, your home, it could be community scale, it could be utility scale. Is there something from what you can tell about economies of scale or that there's a sweet spot uh, with respect to the economics, or is it all good and just it plays different roles? The, 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 the really cool issue, not cool, the really important issue I'll say is what, what we call the value of resiliency. So the really big commodity that, that we know like in Ann Arbor or Southeast Michigan had the storms this year is a lot of people lost power for extended windows of time. I, I have a friend of mine with a battery and he never lost a minute of, of power, um, but he was able to afford it, right? And for him, he was able to afford it and the value of resiliency and not losing power was so important to him that he spent a lot of money to build a very resilient system. But it's the equity piece and not everybody can afford it like that. Not everybody has that vision of resiliency. They simply can't pay for it. So that's, we have to work on that. There has to be some solutions that make this a little bit different, that offer some benefits to folks that simply can't afford, you know, pay for it. I think community solar and storage has that benefit that moves the needle from them having to upfront the cost to build the storage to one where they actually participate 
and they participate more in the benefits that, that are aggregated. So that's why I start to see movement away from putting everything in a basement to putting everything in a space that's that's scalable that makes benefits available to DTE or consumers, whoever as well. It's it's layering the benefits that are going to move the needle. Hey, go ahead, Lee. Sounds like Lee has another question. Lee. The resilience question, uh, I think uh, more often if we talk about the distribution grid and at the same time we say the collection grid, then all of a sudden when there's a power outage, it's not just customers out there, it's actually your source of supply. And so if we'd use the grid both directions, everyone's interest in keeping the resilience that up and going would improve. I'd like yeah. to call it a collection grid instead of a distribution grid. Yeah, fair enough. That whole DER, the distributed energy resources, where we're starting to do things locally to attach are effectively what you're talking about. Um, and that's really the premise behind the SEU in, in Ann Arbor is being able to bring in renewable energy and add the resiliency in the same piece. So if that can be accomplished, I think everybody wins. Go ahead, Dave, with your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit curious about aggregation. Is that a, mainly a software oriented thing or you have a controller in addition to your voltage controller and, and battery charging and all that, but you've also got a controller for the aggregation aspects of the power that you, you're generating? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a community that's actually in forming stages. I can't name it, but it's out there and it's happening where they're putting, it's a community that's got, they're gonna put solar on the roof. They're gonna put batteries in everybody's facility. The battery is gonna be used every day by the owner for peak shaving. So that it dispatches in the peak of the hour and it dispatches its energy and from the solar and it reduces their demand. But also, that same battery can be called upon by the utility in an aggregated format. So all the batteries in that whole community, they'll, they'll have to basically shut off at a certain minimum state of charge and maintain some level of charge left in them so they can aggregate together and dispatch to the grid based on a signal. So if, if it were a, a voltage signal or something like that coming off the grid, it can dispatch to the grid. There's a lot of things that are part of that controlling aspect that I'm, I'm making that sound easy that aren't so easy because there's frequency matching and all kinds of things that have to happen for that storage, aggregated storage to move to the grid. But it's being studied right now in Michigan. And that's what's really cool about it is I think it'll, it, I think it'll move forward um, again kicking and screaming with some people being dragged into this, but if you don't do it once, you won't do it. And I, I, it makes total sense to me at the scale we're talking about. And, and Chuck, how important do you think the electric vehicle to either the home or the grid is gonna be in the kind of the future for us dealing with storage? Is Are the EVs gonna be, be a big part of our storage or, or not? I, that's a tough one. I it, it's really hard for me to say because it's you know things like the big three strike. How long is that going to last? How is it going to impact the EV availability? Um, who can afford an EV? Um, you know, right now there's not too many bi-directional chargers out there. There's there's one really good company and there's some that are trying to catch up to them. But um, I think if we can keep the technology moving um, in a a manner that reduces the cost to the to the person investing that building the infrastructure then becomes simple and having the resiliency that it provides locally to your home is an is a no brainer it's can it be aggregated to a point where it makes a difference and it would take everybody and their brother in their neighborhood to have bi-directional charging and push power to the grid to really be in fact impactful beyond your home because it just takes so much energy so I think it might be more grid edge, grid edge being all the way to the edge of the grid and basically in the community level where that might make a difference. I'm, 
I'm not going to say it won't happen. I just think it's going to take a long time before it's really adopted to the point where it makes a difference to the grid. Okay. Well, we're right at eight o'clock. I wonder, uh, Mark, do you, uh, you're muted. Would you like to unmute and say uh, some, uh, anything to uh, conclude our session here? Hopefully we still have a question. <laughs> Hey, Steve, do you uh, want to go ahead with a question before? Uh... Yeah, real real quick. Um, what, Chuck, is your take on this, uh, these new uh, high temperature thermal electric battery systems? Have you been following that? Are they competitive? They're making heat like for industrial or, you know, whole schools. Have you been following that? Do you have an impression about those and cost effectiveness? You know, that another great question is where are we where are we going after lithium? I mentioned this in long duration storage. There's so many research projects going on. Um, I'm an advisor to the Department of Energy. I I'm not going this month. I was supposed to go down to a to a session they have where we're screening all these technologies. So the funding the DOE provides to the labs and researchers gets gets focused on the technologies that are gonna make the most sense. And like last year, I was in a session where somebody made the statement that we're going to use seawater and iron and we're going to have a sustainable battery. And, it, and I had a hard time getting my head wrapped around the technology because it just didn't make sense. I couldn't make I couldn't figure out how that would work. So, you know, when, <laughs> when, I, when I see technologies that, you know, it would be great if it did. Right. I mean, it's you know, I don't have to go mine lithium in, in Ecuador. I can I can um, do something very simple. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know where these are going to go. We're very cautious on commercial viability. Um, again, for that same example I raised earlier, I've been involved with, with um, vanadium redox and zinc, zinc air batteries, which are flow batteries for 15 years now, 20 years, I think, now that I'm thinking about it. And they they were going to come out and be commercial, and that's happened every year for that period of time. It's just really hard for these technologies to get over the hump. So. I'll be watching to see who vets the technology and can validate that they're going to operate sustainably for a window of time. Most operate out of the box really quickly, and then they fade, or their round trip efficiency, which means they they take more energy to charge than discharge, get out of whack. And now the technology doesn't make sense. And I'm I'm really cautiously optimistic that these flow batteries, some of them um, that I see like um, with Iron Air. Are going to come out and make make a difference, but again, we're watching closely. There was a uh, so John, I got unmuted. There was I a question. To unmute. <laughs> oh, good, you good, good. Yeah, there was a question about contact information, but I see it's on the bottom of your last slide there, Chuck. So, anybody, uh, we we've got uh, Chuck's email address and his phone number there if you want to follow up with him. And uh, yeah, Mark, do you have any uh, parting words for us? Yes, Chuck, I really want to thank you for, for giving this presentation. Uh, um, I've been ex excited when it's, we, we first talked about this about a year ago, and I'm really glad to see that this has come to fruition. Um, we published uh, Chuck's full article on community solar in the uh, uh, fall issue of uh, My Sun Rising. So anybody who wants to get access to that can contact me, and um, I can send, you, send that out to you. Um, Chuck has agreed to come back. Uh, a couple times next year in 2024 to give some um, some more talks in related subject areas, and we can get an update on um, this kind of stuff as well. Chuck, I just want to finish with, with I guess one simple thing. Um, there's lots of talk about community solar in the legislature. Everybody's got an opinion. Um, yeah, for GLREA members, um, can you give if we're going to write a letter or send an email to our elected representatives at the local, state, or federal level, or somebody at the Michigan Public Service Commission? What's the one single message we should be sending about energy storage besides you guys should start listening to Chuck? I mean, what what should we be saying? You know, look at resiliency or make sure you don't forget about storage or what What should we say? You know, that's a, I really can't answer that, Mark. There's so many directions we could go. Okay. Um, you know, the bills that are out there have been crafted by some smart people. I think they're they're all attacking something at a different level or different scale. Some are equity driven, some are scale driven. Um, the, the, the whole energy storage roadmap was pretty audacious in terms of how big they, they feel we need to go with storage. 
Um, and mm -hmm. frankly, it's so big that if we don't start moving soon, we're not going to get there. And I don't know what the outcome of that is, right? So it's going to take mm -hmm. a lot of thought, and I'm, I'm not the right guy to probably answer that one, unfortunately. All right. Well, we'll keep thinking about that and uh, get you back again. Thank you so very much. And uh, John, I'll, I'll let you close this out.